Hi there, this is Doug, the Eclipse Whisperer again. Um, in earlier videos I used to <clears throat> say that I was not Scott Zahn, uh, but nobody remembers who that was anymore, so that's not important. Um, and I'm definitely not Tony King or Scott King, so not those people. You probably don't know who they are either. I am me, and hello again. Uh, so anything worth doing once is worth doing twice, and I don't think you all realize this, or probably don't care, uh, the number of hours it takes for me to do these stupid videos, even the impromptu sounding th ones that there are. And here I am on a Sunday night at 7 o'clock. This is the second time I'm doing this video, because the first one's a little rough around the edges. Thought I'd save a little time for you. But uh, I realized sane people would find just about anything else to do at 7.16 p.m. on a Sunday. Honestly, I'm all out of things to watch on Netflix, and I'm probably insane. Uh, so, uh, so let's get started on another training video on our favorite subject, Epic or Eclipse. Uh, and this is going to be the second video in a series uh, the f on pricing uh, uh, and uh, matrix pricing. Uh, the first video was rather long, uh, but uh, uh, kind of had to be. And this uh, discussed the, the standard pricing matrix that uh, groups customers into customer classes and products into cell groups, and then creates uh, formulas in the, in the uh, two uh, the ad uh, adjoining crosses um, using the quick cell matrix. Contracts are a different breed of cat, and they're kind of a little kooky on how they're created, but uh, they're not really terribly uh, complex to get your head around. But um, so, a uh, contract. When would you use a contract? Um, if you if you do things well, you know almost all the pricing is going to be covered in your standard matrix, and hopefully you will you will regularly do um, quarterly or annual. Uh, reviews of your customers and make sure that you've you know put them in the right product classes um, or uh, customer classes and giving them appropriate uh, margins and discounts. Um, I never worked for a company that ever did that, but hopefully you're one of them. Um, and 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 uh, and and uh, thank thank God's to you if you <laughs> are actually doing that. Um, uh, also, of course, you know, in my in in my life, I said you go through all this trouble of coming up with this really elaborate scheme of you know pricing, um, and you think you get it dialed down really good, and then you run sales reports and come to find out that your salesmen are doing price overrides on about ninety five percent of the products anyway. And you, yeah, so my. My general feelings on uh, pricing matrices is, you know, make it as simple and maintainable and as floating as possible uh, to, to get you in the ballpark uh, as a guide for the salesman, you know, somewhere to start. But don't expect that people are going to follow it rigidly. Uh, wouldn't it be nice? But um, now you junior salesmen, the one, you know, the ones that you've got at the counter, they're just starting. Yeah, they should probably, you know, <clears throat> follow along with what the computer says. But, you know. Every company operates differently. Anyway, blah, 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 blah. So let us get started. And boy, I wish I had better things to do with my life. But uh, so if we go into uh, maintenance and a contract is starts out um, as a customer record, um, or maybe I should step back a bit and say that um, in the pricing matrices, this is tied to a specific customer record. You can take uh, a, a one of your existing customers and you can create a matrix just for that customer or just their job, uh, their, their ship to instead of the bill to. I would not recommend it because it's too easy to lose the contracts, uh, lose track of them, uh, forget they're in there. You're going to break all the rules and do it with numbers that uh, don't float, and uh, and you're gonna have a devil of a time um, remembering them, uncovering them, and fixing them. So, what is suggested you do is you create a unique customer record that is a contract uh, instead of a specific customer, uh, and and then uh, uh, do your pricing in that and assign that contract. Um, 
to uh, customers as needed. In, uh, in, in, in my goings, uh, typically the contract was uh, more uh, vendor specific, like uh, Leviton would have, would have a, a contract uh, price for a particular job the customer was having. And so you'd have the contract named uh, you know, Acon Leviton or something like that, or maybe the job and, and then assign it accordingly. Anyway, I'm, I'm sure this probably sounds like gibberish because you kind of have to see it in order for it to make sense. All right, so um, let's see here. Where do we start this? In, uh, in my systems back in 2005, we were told by the installers, you know, you want to make a, a, a customer contract look different from a customer record, so come up with some type of uh, prefix that you can tell that it's not a customer you're dealing with. And uh, back then, in that case, they said use ACON uh, for a contract, and rebates would be a or a reb or a rebate, that type of thing. Um, of course, as it turns out, there's an awful lot of able electrics or AAA electricians or nonsense like that that gets towards the top. So, so it it, it kind of breaks that a little bit. I would suggest that you do uh, you know, Z-Con because there's not, they're not a whole lot of triple Z electrics or something like that that are, you know, and, and the contracts and rebate customers will fall down to the end of your reports instead of be stuck in the uh, beginning and mixed around with some of the, the a able electric uh, <laughs> customers that you've got. Anyway, since our system is old, um, it still conforms to the Acon format. So let's go ahead and uh, take a look at a example one. And I have one down here. All right, little glitch there. So uh, I set up an example contract earlier and then of course it wasn't showing up. So uh, we have Acon Z test. All right. So for the most part, this looks like a standard uh, customer record, and it is, but you're never gonna sell to this customer on a sales order. Uh, it's just kind of a marker in the database, something to attach the matrix to uh, so you can work with it. Uh, the only thing that's particularly important in the settings here, as best as I know, is that you should probably, in credit controls, have this flagged as a no order entry uh, customer because you don't want salesmen to somehow fat finger things and do a sales order to what's a contract. Um, not that it really does any damage if it's just a regular COD thing, but it does kind of mess up your sales reporting and yeah, goofy shit like that. So uh, no order entry flag always. Uh, other than that, uh, you know, I would suggest using the address of your company or something, any additional, you know, references that you can make that, oh, this is not a customer, this is a contract pointer. And uh, and there you are. Once you have the, the uh, customer created, the contract customer created, or the, the contract created as a customer, <laughs> what's the best way of saying that? Good grief. Keep in mind, this is my second recording. It's getting late. It's been a long Sunday. I'm getting a little punchy anyway. And as I said, I just love doing these twice. Anyway, so let's close this off here. Um, so the next thing to do here would be to go ahead and, and uh, populate the matrix uh, with the, uh, with the uh, pricing that we need. Before we get into the quick sell matrix where we actually put in the formulas, I want to give you a little bit of background on uh, what the formulas look like and uh, what the basis number is on. So in a, in a matrix cell, if you saw the first video, and God's help you if you lived through all 53 minutes of that, um, you saw that there's a, there's a pricing basis name that, that, uh, that you usually do a formula off of uh, in, in the matrix. And if you don't, Every system that's created is going to have their own uh, ba pricing basis names depending on how it was set up. So yours is not going to have the same basis names as mine. So if you're following this along and you try and do it in your own system, you go, waha, none of this matches up. What the hell? So this is to explain why it doesn't match up. And hopefully you can go through the process of figuring out how yours matches up so you can duplicate my work. You are welcome. 
Anyway, if we uh, take a look at pricing and price line, as we saw before in the first video, and pick on our favorite uh, 3M, Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing. Um, all right. So here you have a global price basis. These uh, the global global price bases. Excuse me. Uh, here you see on the global, these are the, the names that are used in the programs that are Eclipse. These are hard-coded into the actual programs that make up Eclipse in, that are written in uh, PicBasic uh, because this is a universe database, a PIC system, which predates uh, SQL databases by two decades. Uh, uh, here on this, you see the basis names. Every system that's created, uh, the installer is going to ask the you know the people at the time what names you want to use for different prices, and that's why every system is going to be different because it's customizable. Internal to the program, these are used, but you know when you the user are doing things, you're using these. Um, and the price line maintenance is where these mappings occur and hopefully someone hasn't gacked this up and you're using the same names and bases for all of your price lines or God help you, you got some untangling to do. So uh, here we see uh, the uh, basis name created perch uh, is mapped to uh, a purchase break. Um, or replacement cost or standard cost in the system, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I don't know if every system out there is like this. Probably not. Um, as, as I was saying, the price matrix uh, formulas you can put in are incredibly flexible. I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a way of putting in a formula to be able to adjust price according to customer's hair color. But um, but in most cases, you know, you're using you're using <laughs> a a basis name plus some type of formula or hard dollar value to arrive at what your selling price is, and this is why you need to know what you are using. Uh, some companies may be just doing a markup from purchase price. Uh, some may be doing a markup from average costs for some strange reason. Uh, some may have recorded in the trade service column three price and are doing a discount off of trade service column three. If you're old style, your system has been in place for 27 years and you've got a lot of old blue hairs that remember the old uh, trade service uh, catalogs and like to do discounts off column three in their thinking. Like my dear 81 year old uncle uh, <laughs> was back in the day when he was running all sale and the arguments he we used to get into. What fun. Um, anyway. So uh, when you see me do the formulas in, in all of our uh, in all our formulas in our system, we use a invented number called calc, which is calculated cost or uh, mapped in the system. It's referred to as commission cost. Uh, that is the that is the invented number that is used as the basis that you're calculating the commissions that you're paying to your salesman if you're doing that. Um, uh, why is that a different number from the actual pur purchase price or the average cost? Um, there are good reasons for that. Um, and sometimes you might have, uh, when something is brought into stock, there were shipping charges that were incurred. And you want to, you want to bury those shipping charges into the, the, the price to, to recoup your shipping uh, expense. Uh, you might have a super hot price on just a particular part or couple of parts, and you don't want to uh, poison your market by l lowering things 10-15% for that month's super hot price, only to have to get into a lot of arguments with your customers next month when the prices return to normal. Um, or, uh, as I see quite often, uh, you might have salesmen that are ninnies, um, uh, that, uh, you know, Larry the liquidator that likes to sell everything at the counter at 3% over cost. And uh, I don't suggest, nor do I agree with this thinking, but I have seen a lot of managers that give me the argument that we've got to pad everything 10 or 15% so that when Larry the liquidator goes to give it away to his buddy at the special hot, hot price, because uh, he likes his buddy, we're still making enough money that uh, off of it that uh, you know that we're not having to turn off the lights because we can't pay the electric bill. I do not agree with it. I think I think you know you should keep your salesmen uh, abreast and accurate if they're selling things too low. 
That's management. Don't expect software to do management for you. You know, call them into the office, you know, uh, uh, explain to them nicely, point out, you know, you're selling this stuff too low, bring your margins up, blah, 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 or else that kind of thing. Don't expect software. Don't, don't be, don't, it's, uh, to me, it's like Las Vegas, you know, don't, don't hobble your, your poker dealer's uh, job by, by uh, adding additional marks to the cards or other stuff that, uh, so you're playing a double level game. I don't, don't believe in that double cross shit. Anyway, um, some companies do that. Anyway, that's the reason why a calculated cost, a commission cost uh, field might differ from the purchase price. Uh, you know, most companies, almost everything, the purchase price and the, and the calc costs are going to be the same, except in the, the few exceptions, as I said, hot price or recouping uh, uh, shipping costs. <clears throat> anyway, so price line maintenance is where you go to figure out what your basis names are and what they map to. Um, and and it is, I, I would say, generally, it's a pretty good idea to do all your uh, pricing matrix formulas based on the commission cost, whatever you name that in your system. Okay, now let's look at an actual product and take a look at what prices you're going to be actually applying. So let's take a look at a one of our test products. Uh, uh, which I call Zprod, I think. You probably see a pattern with me. Zprod1 stock test product. Okay, in, in uh, the products, you're going to have loaded price sheets that you've hopefully done regularly or getting through a catalog service, and this will show your the actual prices you have loaded in your system. Notice these basis prices again. Now you know where they came from. <laughs> and uh, And... And so as you're trying to create a matrix and you're getting all kinds of goofy, you think odds are you've goofed and you're using, you're using the wrong basis names and the wrong price. Here is a good example. In this sample product, the actual pur purchase price is a penny. Um, but we're using a commission cost of four pennies. Uh, because in this one, hey, I just felt like screwing the customer. No. I <laughs> <laughs> We're going to assume there were shipping costs incurred, so I buried that into buried that into the cost. So uh, here's a good example. So if we did a formula of a markup from purchase price, we're going to mark it up from a penny, but we're going to do formulas that are based on calc costs, so we're going to mark it up from four cents. You see the difference? I know this will make more sense as we go further. Uh, trust me? Well, trust me, don't trust me. Um, we'll see. Okay, now where the real magic happens. Uh, our favorite tool, the quick sell matrix. All right, which is of course the same tool that we used in video number one where we were dealing with the standard uh, customers, classified and price classes, products uh, uh, grouped in cell groups, the XY juncture of the cell is where we put in the formula, and Bob's your uncle and everything's wonderful. Uh, so the quick sell matrix does a variety of wonderful, exciting things. As we said, if you if you look by class, then it's going to give you um, the the formulas um, from the customer pricing class point of view. Um, and if we do it by um, the cell group, uh, then you're going to look at all the price classes and their formulas from the product cell group point of view. Uh, and here, the next uh, right way to go is, uh, in the case of a contract, we're going to look at from the from the customer point of view, the customer contract. Now, as I said, you can create a matrix specific to a for real customer, say Longhorn Electric, um, and put in a bunch of formulas there. I as I said, I suggest you not do it because it's too easy to lose track of that contract because it's buried in there. If you've got it in several jobs. Trying to maintain it becomes just a real bear. And that's why you create a, 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 a bogus, a not, not real customer record and a matrix on that record and then apply that to a for real customer. So let us go ahead and do our thing again. Uh, Acon Z test. All right. Pay close attention to dates. Um, as we said, Eclipse is not a SQL database. 
Um, it is not a two-dimensional database. It is what they call it, what they call a multi-value database. Uh, it is a PIC system. Uh, the underlying database is called Rocket Universe. Um, it was originally a product that was uh, invented by Dick Pick back in Richard Pick back in 1968 or so. Uh, it's changed many hands over the years. IBM had it for many years. They named it Universe, their fla flavor of it anyway, and then Rocket Systems bought that and incorporated it into their product line. This ancient, ancient database technology, and it doesn't work like a lot of databases that most people are familiar with. Anyway, Universe is a three-dimensional database, uh, or otherwise put a real-time timeline system. Dates are super important. Uh, both in reports, both in matrices, um, because you can, thanks to this wonderful multi-value 3D database, you can set things for in what time these take effect. Uh, you can create contracts that don't go into effect till the future. You can create contracts that happened in the past. Um, you can get lazy and just create one contract once and leave the effective date forever and then just change the pricing as need be. I don't suggest you do that because if there is a, if there is a credit rebill, it fucks up what price that you <laughs> end up using in the credit rebill. So in a perfect world, what you do is you set the effective date uh, for when you want this to go to effect. Usually it's a month from now, right? Because you're proactive and you set a hard expiration date on it. So, you know, usually every three months prices change. So three months later, it should automatically expire. So you are not losing your ass by selling things lower than what the, what the, uh, the new uh, sell prices are. Um, unless, of course, you're doing um, something like a floating contract that's doing formulas instead of hard dollar values, which I highly suggest. And I also know almost none of you will do. Uh, anyway, so... Effective date, expiration date, those things are your friends. If you do an open-ended contract that's using floating formulas, then I believe the expiration date you leave blank, uh, and it should fill in as 12319999, which just means forever. Anyway, so this goes into effect as of today. Boy, don't you wish I could say that simply. Now, this is a new contract. We've never applied anything to it. Um, so... Uh, now, in the uh, the standard pricing matrices, which will affect you know all uh, most of the parts in your system that you sell to to a uh, client customer, um, we put a exclamation point in the front and uh, the cell group and so everything every product that's in this cell group, uh, we want this formula applied. Uh, simple, simple. In a contract, you very seldomly do that. Uh, in a contract, you're dealing with a, usually a small group of products, usually way less than 100, sometimes only 20 or 30. So you're usually specifying a specific product um, instead of a group of products. All right. So let's see if we can get a, uh, an example product in here. Okay, so we're going to do our test product. All right. You can do price breaks on these. I normally don't. I've never seen a good use for that. Um, so, uh, it tends to end up making more complications than necessary. So this is a simple matrix, and we're going to do no, pro no quantity price break, which is M. Okay, price basis. No matter what you do formula-wise, there has to be a price basis speci specified, even if it's not actually used. And as we said, we're using uh, our mappings. What is the commission... Uh, uh, cost price, uh, which is mapped in our system to be called calc. All right. Uh, as you can say, see, you, there's a several different ba bases that you could base the formulas on. Okay. Pricing formula. Um, if you look in the big book of Eclipse here, um, if you do some digging, uh, I'd suggest looking up pricing formula. <laughs> <laughs> took me 10 minutes to find that. Uh, you'll, you'll find the guideline in the, in the Eclipse manual about how to, how to formulate the formula. Um, and uh, I try and make it as simple as possible. So, so I use usually a plus and a percentage um, uh, markup uh, to, give me a, to give me a gross margin percent. Um, other people probably more commonly use like a multiplier with you know an asterisk and the formula, like 1.25. Uh, 
uh, markup for a percent. Um, as I said, I, I prefer this one because it's just easier to read for me anyway. But anyway, if you want the you want good examples here, uh, this will show you all the good examples on how to do your formulas. Uh, the only thing I have to suggest is try and be consistent. The more erratic and inconsistent you are, the harder it's going to be to maintain, and the harder it is going to be going to be to untangle what you did wrong. Uh, okay. So price formula. All right. So if I do, I want to in the normal matrix, this would be marked up um, for a gross margin of fifty uh, percent, uh, which would be a one hundred a, a markup of one hundred percent, right? Plus one hundred. Um, for the sake of this contract. I want to mark it up only 25%. Now, I'm really bad at math, so um, I get markup and margins confused all the time, and so over the years I've become very, very paranoid. <laughs> there, are, there are website tools online, uh, or you can create a little spreadsheet with your formulas in it uh, to, as a cheat sheet guide. I highly suggest you do that. I found this old program from a company that went bankrupt years ago. I've been using it for 23 years, and I think they died 15 years ago. Um, this gross profit margin calculator, which uh, helps me confirm that I'm not going to screw up and fat finger things. So say, I don't want to do a 50% markup. I want to do a 30% um, markup. So let's see that. Okay, so the formula, the markup formula, it says I should be putting in there is 42.86 uh, to give me a gross profit margin of 30%. Um, as I said before in the previous video, when I first got into uh, wholesale distribution, I didn't understand retailing math. <laughs> Screwed things up really badly for a few months until I went, aha! <laughs> and this is why I'm super paranoid about that now. Okay, so so I'm going to do the uh, 42.86, which translates to a 30% markup. Okay, good. Uh, the per quantity and unit of measure is uh, uh, not really being applied here because it's not... Um, it's not a price break uh, uh, type of thing. And since this is a formula, we can leave it uh, forever. Fine, no problem. All right, so that is how it should be done. Now I'm going to show you how you're going to do it. Uh, because in my 17-year career in wholesale distribution, it seems like outside salesmen really, really hate floating contracts um, because they go out and get the customer liquored up at lunch or I don't know what. Somewhere they get to negotiate a hard dollar value. And, uh, and there's arguments in there. Do not create contracts with a hard dollar value uh, because now you've, you've multiplied by orders of magnitude how much time you have to spend on contracts and maintenance, constantly keeping those prices accurate. Uh, instead of just letting them float in any time the calculated cost is changed in the product maintenance record, hopefully every time you, you know, upload a new vendor spreadsheet and do a price change, um, then the contract floats automatically. But as I said, salesmen don't like it. Um, I assure you'll be yelled at, and the two things that I told you never, never to do, don't do hard dollar values, and don't, don't create contracts that don't have an expiration date if you do do hard dollar values i guarantee you're going to do both um and you know god's bless you <laughs> i just warned i warned you uh there's going to be hell for that all right so this is what it would look like if we do a hard dollar value in. once again also be consistent and now that i've said it i know you won't um so we're going to do a non-stock test product. Um, all right. And this is going to be a hard dollar value entry, but the price break still has to be no price brace. Even though it's not used in a hard dollar value formula, it still has to be entered in there. You cannot create the damn line unless you do. A hard dollar value starts with a dollar sign. Uh, and that says this is not a formula. This is just actually apply this price. Um, and uh, I'm going to say that this is uh, 0 0.02. All right. Like that. Okay. Um, so 
as I said, this is what you never, never do. This is what you want to do. Um, this is what you're going to do. <laughs> anyway, um, you should also never mix these things together. And now that I've said it, yep, that's what you're going to do. <sighs> anyway, I warned you. Uh, so, uh, once, you, once you've got that all in there, and once again, pay attention to the effective date, this goes in immediately. Normally, you'd be putting a contract in a month before it goes into effect. Ideally, if you got your shit together, I'm going to assume you don't, because I never did. Anyway, so we do a save. Uh, our log is going to pop up, and, and we go ahead and close this out. All right. So there's a couple of different ways to audit the matrix uh, and make sure that you didn't do something incredibly stupid. And if you're like me, probably every third time you do it, you're going to do something incredibly stupid. So you want to catch that before you roll it out to everybody. One of those, you know, also not making contracts effective immediately is a good way to do that. <laughs> so um, in pricing under reports, you will see this... Uh, report called customer pricing proof and that's the closest thing I've found to useful for trying to catch the big mistakes with um, contract pricing um, hopefully before I apply it to anybody or it goes into effect so uh, I'm just gonna pick branch one because I didn't do branch specific contracts so it doesn't really matter what branch I'm doing it to effective date once again keep this in mind um, Say you did a contract and it expired uh, in December 1st. Um, and then I decided to go into contract and I want to edit and change some pricing and such. And I put in the effective date of 3rd, but it expired on the 1st. Uh, when I get into the contract, you know what it's going to show me? Nothing. Because all the cells expired. <laughs> so, so if I wanted to see the expired cells and then modify the contract and extend its uh, its uh, uh, its its date range of operation, I'd have to I'd have to put in you know December first or prior to that. So keep that in mind if you if you go to e edit a contract you already had in place and you go in and all the all the matrix cells are blanking. Oh my God, what happened? That's what happened. You're looking at the wrong effective date. Anyway, blah 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 blah. Um, so we're gonna we want customer pricing proof as of this we're not doing a we're doing we we're doing not a customer we're doing a contract that's pretending to look like a customer all right so we wouldn't we wouldn't be doing this on the customer that the contract is applied to we're doing it on the contract I know that doesn't make any sense yet it will all right so Acon Z test all right, this is important. Remember that basis that we used, right? Um, so the default is going to be COGS cost, which I think maps to, uh, what is it, average cost or so in the system. Um, and it's going to give you, if you did all the formulas on calc cost, then you just told it to show you the GP based on a different basis, which means none of your numbers are going to match up. So pay attention to this. If, if in your case, uh, you know, as I said, in our system, calc maps to commission cost so I have to change this basis to commission cost so I'm seeing the right margins with that price basis I know that probably won't make any sense you'll goof a couple of times when you go oh my god why isn't why aren't these formulas working out this plus this does not equal 10% how come I'm getting 10% margins that's probably why you ran the ran the report on the god dang wrong cost basis so uh, you want to see show GP percent. You do not want to see all price lines. If you do that, it'll it'll throw all the price lines into the in, into the report, which that's that's not what's on the contract. Uh, you just want to see the products are on the report. So that's no. So we do file hold. Um, now I've got programs that I've done. I export it to a text file because I have very large contracts, and uh, they would convert it to a spreadsheet, and I could do my tweakies there. Uh, but since this is a short contract, we can just, uh, uh, and thank you, Phantom, for telling me it's done. Um, we can go in and uh, look at it in our report queue. All right, so here is our contract. All right. And so this, uh, this proof report uh, helps me to check all fuck-ups. 
Okay, so... Alright, that's... I was hoping for 30. It's just a little bit off. The math is always just a little slightly off, but uh, okay, that one's good. This one that I did a hard dollar value. Once again, this is why you don't want to do hard dollar values. Oh, gee, I, I screwed up. I I didn't... I, I really meant to sell it at like a 25% margin, but I didn't check my costs first. My costs are two cents, so now I'm selling it no zero margin. Oh hell, that's really stupid. <laughs> and this is why you don't do hard dollar value contracts. You knit, but you're going to do it anyway. Anyway, so customer pricing proof is your friend to catch these and fix them before you roll them out and start losing money. Because if you do that, uh, the company will fail and your paycheck thingy will go away. Which they tell me is a bad thing. Unless you like living out on a tent. And out here in Los Angeles, that's pretty common. Of course, also smoking crack, um, being half naked, wandering in and out of Monday morning traffic, and acting like a crazy person. So, eh, potato, potato, lifestyle changes. Anyway, so customer pricing proof, your friend. All right, very na last step, and that is assigning the contract to customers. Now, in in uh, in in our situations that I had, um, as I said, you were creating a separate customer just to be able to keep track of contracts. Uh, you can embed them into a customer. Don't 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 do it. Um, and. Uh, most of the contracts that I've worked in the past, typically we had contracts for very large customers. Some were residential, some were industrial, and there's a certain mix of parts, like for the resi guys, that you absolutely have to, you know, cut it down to, to cost, or else you won't get any of their business. And hopefully you make it up on the other stuff. And so things like, you know, half-inch conduit, uh, and and uh, half-inch PVC, and uh, conduit couplings, uh, set screw connectors, Romex wire, that type of stuff. That you might sell at, at a hard 7% above cost or something like that, because they'll just go somewhere else unless you're giving that stuff to them essentially for free, uh, or at cost anyway, which is close to free. Um, and so you'd have, you might have 10 or 15 customers that you will assign that that contract to just for your your hot customers in in my company we called that a hot sheet um and there was a spreadsheet that we'd send out every month um to those those uh large customers so they knew what those commodity price was were for the common items to quote their jobs um so you might see something similar anyway assigning a contract to a customer all right so we're gonna we're gonna Go to one of our test customers, and we're going to do test COD customer, and we're going to do pricing, and customer pricing and printing. All right, as you can see here, ordinarily for any parts that aren't in a contract, uh, you know, the standard matrix applies. They are default price class small, and when they buy a product that is, you know, 50, 40, 30, 20, you know, it's going to be a 100% uh, markup. Um, from CalCost, uh, that would be their standard pricing according to the standard matrix. The contract, if the product is on the contract, it will override that, that prior matrix. Um, there is a special control maintenance flag that is in Eclipse in, in the system that, uh, that basically tells it that if you've got multiple contracts or multiple mat matrices that the particular part uh, exists in, yeah, to keep hunting until it finds the one that has the lowest price and put that on the sales order. That is the standard control maintenance record. That can be set to something else. I would not suggest it. If you want to drive yourself completely insane and not know what pricing that is uh, the, the customer is going to get, regardless of what uh, contracts you've assigned, then, then change that flag. Uh, if you don't like being completely insane, and oh, why did you get into IT if you, if you did, uh, <laughs> then leave that flag in place. Anyway, so yeah, so system the default flag is to check for best price. So if there's several contracts assigned with that product on it, it'll go to the one that's got the lowest price. All right, assigning the contract. You click on co contract and you search for the contract and you assign the contract. Uh, okay, Acon, and we're going to do the Acon Z test. All right. And we do OK. All right. And let's go ahead and 
save the changes. All right, and so our Z customer, COD test customer, has the contract applied to them. Uh, super cool, yeah. I know what you're thinking right now. You're thinking, but Doug, um, I'm extremely paranoid and I don't trust computers because uh, humans don't make mistakes, but computers often do. So how do I know for sure, for sure, for sure that this is really, really working? All right. Well, um, you go into a sales order uh, and you can, there are some tools there that you can audit the pricing and the sales order for the, that particular customer if you need the assurances that it absolutely is working. Because as we said, you're uh, some weird nit that seems to think that uh, humans are less fallible than computers are. <laughs> and what an interesting life you must have. Okay, so we go sales order entry here and we're gonna pick our, our COD customer that we did these things to and we're gonna do a new bid, whoops. Uh, hold on, I'm going to stop that for a moment and change my users. Something wrong with my user account. The sales order shows the actual margins and not the, the other one. So let me uh, uh, switch this. Sorry about that. I keep forgetting to fix that little glitch in the system. I guess I'm a bad system administrator. All right, order, sales order entry. Where were we again? Blah, blah, blah. Okay. Z customer, our COD customer record, yes, new, okay, and as you can see here, we're doing a bid, so we're not committing any stock. All right, so um, we want to sell one product, uh, Z prod, and we start start off with our first one in the matrix, which was the stock test product. All right. All right, which we're going to have to pull from branch one because it's over there. All right, so here we can see um, our, our default view in our system anyway. Keep in mind, every company out there has got a different default view. <laughs> and I'm sure you are probably not seeing the one that I am seeing. Uh, depending on who you are and how your system is set up, uh, there are multiple views that you will see in the sales order and thank you for making that go away uh, all right so in my system i have all these wonderful views here i had to put them in a um, um, microsoft paint because of the, i've got a dual screen monitor and it likes to stick it on the other monitor uh, which is annoying anyway um so uh here we see how this got done where did this price come from so it's based on the calc price bases that was the formula that was applied that was the price it arrived at if you see a little plus sign in there that tells you that this is a contract price uh, there are different views in here to to uh, to uh, narrow that down a little bit better so let me take that out of the way and um, okay so other views uh, so we can take a look at formula unit price all right and that tells us pretty much the same thing okay what's another view um we can do uh an audit pricing view all right hey now this gets a little better it tells us it was a contract okay product specific contract not a group uh with a quantity break of one so uh here we've got a little a little more positive feedback of where the hell did the price come from um and very helpful as i said before red plus sign means this is a this was derived from a contract not from the normal uh, uh customer price class uh, versus cell group uh, uh, price matrix formulas and i will go ahead and delete that line and close this why can't i ever find that thing uh, delete line item yes and close yes i want to delete the order okay so that's amazing even though i talk faster and cut out a lot of bullshit uh, this video actually took two minutes longer than the first one <sighs> god's help me
anyway, I, that should cover everything. As I said, this is not terribly complicated. It's just a certain way of looking at it. Once again, the Eclipse Help Manual is your friend. Uh, reading, good idea. Uh, anyway, so I hope this uh, will be some help in demystifying how contracts are created. In our next video, we will cover rebates because we're out of time here, and I'm sure you don't want to listen to my charming voice for another 45 minutes. And besides, I'm hoarse and I'm tired. It's 8.06 on a Sunday, and it's about time for me to take my shower and go take nappy nappy because Monday is going to be here buff before you know it. So thank you for your time and attention. This has been Doug Fashing. Have a wonderful evening, morning, afternoon, or um, whatever time, uh, however time flows in your dimension. <laughs> Good night and, and, uh, and be well.